ready? Yes, I am. Great. Let me share my screen. Perfect. So um, sharing it. Wonderful. Um, I think I was asked to give an additional update or deep dive into the educational um, part. And I would love to start. I mean, we already heard um, why it is important, but especially also on the educational part, because they are quite some reports. And I think it's just good to know, because sometimes you have to argue, especially with the universities, and when you're coming with the IPCC report, so the reports from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, um, you, I think you can impress them. Um, so basically, in the there is a science, there are different scientific reports, and I will show you two, but there are many more, which are really highlighting that education and learning and awareness building is is really important as a response to the climate crisis. So, for example, you can um, use uh, the IPCC 1.5 report, which came in which came out in October um, 2018. Um, but there is also political will. I will go into this a little bit deeper afterwards, but just to highlight when, when someone is saying like, yeah, it's great what you're doing, but you know, like we have other, we have other things to do. Then you can say like, there was a political will, the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, the Paris Agreement. Um, so there is international political will. And I think the third component, um, why it is so, is so relevant is, is the youth movement. I mean, we have been seeing, um, I mean, you're in Sweden, but, but all over the world, we have been seeing a growing and a huge um, demand of, of action from, from young people, demonstrations, strikes, um, and so on. But there are also different surveys um, for, for like, from citizens. And there we can also see in many of the surveys that educational programs and education in general is, is something what, what, uh, what people really want. And they do see that um, it, it is an important tool for, for making the, this change happen and uh, bending and irreverse the curve. So I think these are three like main arguments you can you can bring when someone um, tries to question. Um, so like you can have the slides. I just um, took all the statements out, so you can just directly <laughs> refer to it. So this is from the from the latest IPCC report, and there you see like in several times they were um, stating on a scientific base that education and access to information is is absolutely crucial for having this accelerate the wide scale behavior changes. Um, but also a little bit later in the in the report, they are writing about um, it's the importance of it for they connected to the sustainable development goals. So you can really see that throughout different um, scientific reports, um, there is an evidence that that the education is needed. Um, there is another report which actually is not even focusing um, is is focusing more on, on oceans and and the cryosphere, so the frozen world. Um, but also there we can see in several several parts of the of the report that they are um, that they are stating investment education and capacity building is is absolutely crucial. Um, so I think this is always good to have as a backup. Um, and yeah, as already mentioned, there are like different surveys which are also stating that then a huge majority of the people do believe that um, educational programs are crucial. When it comes to when it comes to climate climate crisis, and already mentioning um, the youth mobilization. So when we talk about the international agenda, um, there is of course the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, but it's not the only one. And I will go a little bit. I will show you the other ones, but I will focus on the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, the UNFCCC, um, because they are dealing with climate and hence also with climate education. Uh, so there is the initial convention the UNFCCC, the convention itself. And there in the article six, I will show the, um, the part afterwards. Um, there, it's, it, there we mention the importance of education. Later also in the Kyoto Protocol, it is mentioned. Then of course, in the Paris Agreement. Um, then there was an, a special ACE decision taken in Katowice, who was, if someone was at COP24, you might have um, been involved there. And then also 2015, um, it was also mentioned the sustainable development goals with the goal four and the sub goal um, four seven. So you can already see the climate education is somewhere, but sometimes um, because it's like somewhere, it also means a little bit that it's nowhere. Um, but often uh, the climate education part or the raising awareness part is used in from a sentence, they're often used like no one is left behind, um, saying that when we educate everyone, um, 
yeah, it's, it's, it's easier to act. So they try to broaden climate education into all the different streams. Um, yeah, this has pro and cons. We can maybe discuss about this afterwards. So I was saying that already in the convention, I mean, this is back in 1992, I was not on earth back then, uh, maybe most of you haven't been here, but already then, I mean, the parties um, agreed all together at this um, earth summit that education is, is very crucial. Um, and you can you can see it here. I, I don't go to everything, but basically um, they are stating the most important part of how they are seeing this um, education training and public awareness going going to happen. Um, back then it was the Article 6. When we talk today about Article 6, it's mostly we are not referring to education. We're rather referring what was already said um, to the market mechanism. Um, so we can see here basically is a summary of, of what is in the Article 6. Um, this action for climate empowerment, the six elements, which are education, training, public awareness, public um, access to information, public participation, and international cooperation. So this is the set um, they have been laying out and acting upon um, on the international space. And they also have been, of course, writing several um, handbooks and guidebooks. So this is, I think, is the... The most comprehensive one, this, um, I can also send it to you, but you can also find it online, the climate, um, actual climate empowerment guideline um, for the countries on how to implement this on a, a national level, because ultimately, I mean, it's nice what we have internationally, but it's not finding its way into the national agenda and then into implementation. Um, yeah, they are the loose words, which were already mentioned. So these are the six, uh, six main elements we are having internationally. And until today, they are basically the same. I mean, there were some additional activities coming. Um, there, for example, the ACE dialogues. Um, if someone of you attended the subsidiary body meeting, so the meeting in between of two big conferences, which are the subsidiary body meetings, they're happening in like around June, May, June in, in, in Bonn. So there are, um, have been dialogues. This year would have been the last of these dialogues, the eight, but due to COVID, of course, it was um, kind of postponed. We <clears throat> did some regional ones. Then there has been different workshops um, and at the COPS we have the educational day which normally happens I think the first week on Thursday on the first week. Um, so basically one day at the COP there are a lot of events happening around education. Um, so you can see that next to the international agenda, the political outcome, there are also um, throughout the year but also at the COP there is, is something going on on this. Um, and since we are all young, I thought that like, I'm highlighting also some of the youth activities, which are very often also put under this Action for Climate Empowerment agenda. So there are um, global youth video competitions, there is um, the Young and Future Generation Day, also a day where young people and the older generation um, are coming together. So the negotiators and the young people are coming together um, in different events uh, to talk about yeah, what young people, what young people want. There are also youth briefings when we um, meet the um, Executive Secretary General, Patricia Espinoza and other, um, for example, the high level champions. So from the from the, which country the COP is hosted so that we have a chance to exchange with them and, and also express our concerns. But yeah, it's as already mentioned, it's very often also live with the youth washing event, but that's how it is. Um, and then also we had, for example, an action for climate empowerment youth forum where 100 young people, or yeah, I think there were 100 young people came together um, and were discussing on what they want to see, um, what ACE activities, action climate empowerment activities we would like to see. So these are like some, but of course not all um, of the youth activities. I have been already mentioning that in the Paris Agreement, this um, article you saw before, the article six was now compromised <laughs> into the article 12. Um, it's a little bit shorter, but yeah, I think it, do it doesn't really matter because at the end it's really a, what you're doing out of it. Um, but just for your for, no for your knowledge um, that this is the statement in the Paris Agreement, which all countries should act upon. I mean, starting, I mean, the Paris Agreement was already kind of adopted, but we are still running on the Kyoto Protocol, but it doesn't really matter. Um, and yeah, now it goes really into the implementation and this started in Katowice. Um, I don't know, like maybe some of you have been, have been there. Um, and there we agreed on several points. Um, I mean, the parties agreed on several points. The first one is, is that we align the efforts and that we're not um, duplicating work. Uh, I mean, 
yeah, should, should be clear, but there's like so little going on at the moment, unfortunately, that I'm not afraid of um, that we have actually duplications. Um, but I th what I think is, is more important is the second point is that we integrate this international um, climate empowerment agenda into the national um, policy. So in this called NDCs, the nationally determined contributions, which would be the national climate um, plans, um, but also, for example, in the national adaptation plans and in and other national plans. Um, because as long as it's like somewhere there at the UN, um, countries are not really inclined to act upon. So integrating the international efforts into the national agendas um, to then make it happen, which is can also be very relevant for, for whenever, like wherever you are working, so that you can check maybe what they have been writing in the NDC and then you can maybe hold them or try to hold them accountable. Um, yeah, I mean, there's some, some other points. Um, for example, maybe the, the second last one is also can also be interesting. I don't exactly know, for example, who is in Sweden, the ACE focal point, um, but, um, within this framework, they um, they have been saying that every country needs an ACE focal point. So this is a person you can go to and talk about ACE related activities. Um, you can also check it. You can just type ACE um, focal point UNFCCC, and then from Sweden you can, or from the other countries you can you can find them. Um, so this is the person who should coordinate. Sometimes they are very passionate and well equipped, um, and sometimes they are unfortunately not too well equipped. Um, yeah, but this is, is a person you could talk to, maybe. Um, and then I think the last part is also about, about us, um, that all the non-party stakeholders, so everyone is not in the government, this can be movements, this can be other different groups, um, stakeholder groups, um, researchers, for example, as well, um, fostering and strengthening this um, action for climate empowerment agenda. So this, were, this is the, the kind of the future outlook. Um, and yeah, I think at the moment, we would have um, been lobbying a lot to put ACE in the in the national determined contributions, um, but since it is a um, yeah this year it was challenging for everyone. Of course, um, very little countries updated the NDCs has already be, has been mentioning um, mentioned. Um, it's it's quite challenging at the moment, um, but nevertheless, I think it's important that that we that that we try to keep pushing that the that the international agendas go into the national. Uh, national legislations, national um, rules, and so on, because otherwise they're very easy um, forgotten. I have been mentioning at the very beginning that um, the education and climate is not only treated within the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, but also other bodies, for example, the UNESCO, um, which works, of course, on education and science. So they are also working with the Sustainable Development Agenda together, um, especially on the on the SDG four, which is all about education, and then um, more specific on SDG four point seven, which is all about education for sustainable development and global citizenship. Um, yeah, I think there is also there is also this document, Education for Sustainable Development Goals, Learning Objective Objectives, which could could maybe be interesting um, to you. Uh, to, to read a little bit through. So there are different UN bodies focusing on, um, on this educational aspect when it comes to sustainable development and, and climate. And there is also the Higher Education Sustainability Initiative, HAZI. Um, and it was, it was created back at the um, Rio Plus 20 conference, so 20 years later, um, so 2012. Um, yeah. Yeah, 2012 exactly <laughs> and you can also see that there is a wide variety and range of different uh partners um there is UN Desta, unesco unab um and this is exactly also the challenge when it comes to the when it comes to sustainability and and higher education at the un because everyone does a little bit um but no one feels um really responsible um, which can be very challenging because everyone is then kind of shifting it around. Um, but this gives us, I think, even more opportunity to be bold in what we're asking. And we have to be a little bit flexible with like someone, sometimes Prime is coming and then another UN body is coming and the governments are also a little, little bit confused sometimes and it's not making it easier. But I think it also gives us an opportunity um, to come in. And if we understand, it actually can be the case that you understand it maybe better than your um, ministers or whoever would have been responsible for this um, for this agenda. And since I was asked uh, before very quickly also when it comes to Yango, um, so it, Yango, the official children and youth um, constituency, 
this is also a place where you all can engage and they also have a dedicated working group um, when it comes to action for climate empowerment, so everything around education um, and, um, and training and all these six elements. I can also send you the link. So this is, would be then the registration for the constituency. And then um, you can also just text me and I can add you to the working group. It's a, it's a WhatsApp group, um, but they are rather focusing on the, on the international level. But of course, it's, it's, I think it's a good place um, to learn. So these are some updates, but if there are questions, um, don't hesitate. And if it was a little bit overwhelming, I can also share with you the slides um, because it was probably a lot of information. <laughs> Yes, no, but thank you, Maria Claire, and thank you, uh, Nadia. Uh, really appreciate your your um, your insights. And so now we're running a bit tad late on the uh, schedule here, but so we will collect all the questions and we will try to uh, to get them answered, perhaps in a, an upcoming email or so. So 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 you're centralizing that. Uh, and now we'll uh, I'll uh, give the floor to to Adam as he will introduce the next session of the day. Please go ahead, Adam. Thank you.